Bethesda Game Studios is responsible for some of the most popular and fan-favorite games ever made. From Morrowind, Oblivion, to Fallout 3, and all 17 re-releases of Skyrim. But having hit the highest of highs, there's a constant conversation about its decline, and how it has hit brand new lows with their latest release, Starfield. But when did their decline truly start? And what decisions ultimately led us here? People have wildly differing opinions on when things went sideways for Todd Howard and his leather jacket. So I have taken it upon myself to cover what I hope is all of the most controversial decisions in the studio's history, from horse armor to the Creation Club to live service games and even telling their customers that they're wrong. Bethesda is responsible for some of my favorite games, and that will never change, no matter how much they do. But I think it's worth going back and finding out where mistakes were made, even in some of my favorites. This is going to be a fairly long ride, so grab a snack, fetch your nearest mug, and join me in a comprehensive timeline of all of Bethesda's mistakes. To start off, it's important to clarify what Bethesda we're talking about. In its lifetime, Bethesda has been split into two different things. From 1986 to 2001, Bethesda Softworks was a video game studio. But in 1999, when ZeniMax was created, the structure within the company changed. Bethesda Softworks became the publishing arm of ZeniMax, and Bethesda Game Studios was born, transitioning all of the development things into that. To keep this focused, we're really going to be talking about the development studio, which did change names throughout time. But we're also going to exclude some of those earlier years where they were making Wayne Gretzky hockey and Terminator games. And that's because most of Bethesda's early life as a studio is similar to a lot of stories of other great studios from back in the day. A small group of highly ambitious and talented developers working on what they could, until they buckled down and chased their big break. For Bethesda, that was the Elder Scrolls Arena. They were even told by other developers that what they wanted to do was impossible. But inspired by their love of pen and paper RPGs and Ultima Underworld, they created the world of Tamriel. And I have nothing to really say about these early years. There were a lot of good things happening at Bethesda at this time, and not that many mistakes, until we reached Daggerfall. To put things into perspective though, Arena released in March of 1994 and became a cult hit. Daggerfall would release in September of 1996, and it was a massive jump in every possible regard, going from a full-blown and impressive RPG in Arena to a full world with 15,000 towns and over 700,000 NPCs. It changed the progression system from allocating skills that you obtained from experience points and levels to rewarding the player for doing actions that fit in with the role they wanted to play, leading to a system that, after some modifications, is what we have all the way today. It also changed into one of the first fully 3D engines, being the X-Engine. And they did all of this in just 26 months of development time. There are many interviews on the net, but I'll be citing an AMA by Julian Jensen, who was the sole programmer on the game, which he did on the Daggerfall subreddit. In it, he says the deadline was incredibly tight for the project, but it kept ballooning in scope, with many features and ideas being thought of and attempted to be implemented towards the end of development, despite there not being enough time left to even reach the polish needed for release. This led to many people criticizing the large amount of bugs present in the game at launch, as well as it having poor performance and requiring very strong hardware to run things that would be fixed in revisions of the game later on. It's important to note that almost nobody involved in this game would be present by the time we reach Bethesda Game Studios proper. To me, this is just proof that Bethesda itself has a soul of its own, or DNA, because it seems that war isn't the only thing that never changes. In 1997, they would release Battlespire, a standalone dungeon crawler which was initially conceived to be an expansion to Daggerfall, and then they would also release Redguard, which is also set in the Elder Scrolls, but was a Tomb Raider-inspired action-adventure game. Both games did pretty bad. Turns out that people had associated the Elder Scrolls with sprawling open-world RPGs, and going from Arena to Daggerfall 
their audience wanted to see a similar evolution for their next project, instead of a claustrophobic dungeon crawl or a Tomb Raider ripoff. And with two huge failures on the wall, they doubled down to make Morrowind the best they could. Now, this doesn't really reflect on the quality of those two games, I actually think Redguard is pretty fun, but they didn't do what their customers wanted, so we have to put both of these up on the failure wall. So after four years of development, Bethesda provided what people wanted. They jumped engines again, moving to the now legendary Gamebryo engine by Numerical Design Limited, and Morrowind was another huge jump. Thanks to a direct 3D engine capable of lighting, 32-bit textures, proper skeletal animations, and more, Bethesda made a really important decision. The game world would be populated by handcrafted elements like they had done for Redguard. Instead of random algorithmic methods, they employed for the enormous scale of Daggerfall. And I'm sorry to break narration again so quickly, but isn't it insane how full circle we've come? I mean, this gets even better later, but when I drafted this video, I thought it might not be worth doing, but in research, I just came up with all of this stuff that feels kind of prophetic. Anyways, Morrowind released in 2002, and it could easily be considered one of the most influential RPGs, if not games, of all time. And it was a true leap in everything that we'd seen until then. And I know this video is about the mistakes of Bethesda, but it's important to contextualize the great heights that they reached. While Arena and Daggerfall were innovative for their time and respectable in their own right, Morrowind just hit different, both then and now. It's a marvel in design for the time, from the open world to the freedom it presents the player, the skill progression system, and even the way the main quest is arranged, which, while requiring players to complete a number of steps before going to the end of the game, it allows the completion of most of the objectives in whatever order the player wants, applying the same mentality to all of the sub-quests required to complete the quests that you need to do for the big steps, it's really cool. It fleshed out the world of Tamriel, and thanks to all that freedom in building and developing your character, for many people, it was very close to the Dungeons & Dragons games that they had always wished for. After the failure of those two spin-offs, Bethesda really planned on being one step ahead this time, not only returning to the format expected of them, but also closing the gap technologically to be once again the leaders in tech of the industry. And the push for switching to a newer engine and pursuing more ambitious technologies to offer players the best there was, was done by none other than Todd Howard. Morrowind famously started off as a bigger project, but it was scaled down due to it being overly ambitious, and they decided to dial down on a more focused vision, with talks of multiplayer for example being completely discarded a clear indication of how committed they were. Almost the entire first year of development was dedicated to the Elder Scrolls construction set, which allowed staff to iterate in small increments, and that's what the around 40 developers that they had on staff at the time used to make the game. Morrowind, despite this renewed focus, would be delayed from its original slated release of late 2001, and it was pushed back slowly into May 1st of 2002. According to Pete Hines, formerly of Bethesda, it was due to balancing and testing. It also released on Xbox, and both on PC and on Microsoft's console, it was very successful and well received by most, but with the usual complaints. Reviewers and consumers alike agreed that the game had some notable bugs and glitches. The game also required top-tier hardware and was considered a resource hog, and it had other issues, as Greg Kasavin from GameSpot, which is one of my favorite reviewers, said, The very first time you boot up Morrowind, you'll be treated to a memorable, stirring theme filled with soaring strings and booming percussion. You'll proceed to hear it literally every five minutes or so during play. <laughs> uh, Greg would go on the Supergiant Games, which makes things like Hades. So, good job, Greg. Despite these issues, what the game offered at the time was so new, so freeing, that the consensus was that a game this special needed to be played, and Bethesda was on top of the world. It was a triumph, a trend-setting triumph. It set the tone for RPGs and somewhat marks the shift for CRPGs, which are coming back today with things like Baldur's Gate 3, and the move into the modern single-player RPG. Many would compare Morrowind to an MMO, and RPGs of that time would imitate parts of it, but never do it exactly the same. 
earning Bethesda a spot in the pantheon of developers, and the Elder Scrolls a spot in the pantheon of video game franchise greats. And so we reach the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. For many, the last great Bethesda game, although I disagree. Oblivion started development shortly after Morrowind and was once again another ambitious jump. The goals were to flesh out the story, NPCs, and acting, leading to many improvements including the famous Radiant AI system, which was billed as allowing NPCs to lead lives independently of the player, but be affected by events that could simply happen. And of course, the implementation of the Havoc physics engine we all know and love. When it released in 2006, it was praised all over, despite still having some glitches and bugs. But it was such a leap forward that pretty much everyone loved it, and it was a resounding success to solidify the position of the dev and the franchise. It's worth mentioning that while I'm skipping over how buggy and glitchy a lot of these games are, they really were very buggy and glitchy, and we will talk a lot about this later. But there's something more notable with Oblivion, and that's how in 2006 we were all exposed to a concept that was still new to most of us, and that is downloadable content, now commonly known in the shortened DLC, and Bethesda chose to innovate in this department as well. Imagine how naive we were at the time that we all thought it was a cool idea. Back then we were still trapped in either being afraid of putting our credit card info into our 360s or computers, or busy convincing our parents to do it. But from what I can read and what I remember, people thought that a couple bucks for new stuff was amazing. A way to keep adding things to games we loved, especially on console where the idea of mods didn't exist. And for many people that know very little of PC gaming, mods never existed to begin with, I guess. Bethesda would implement its first DLC pack in 2006, and it was the perfectly named Horse Armor. For 250 American, you could equip your horse with some sweet armor. It did nothing, but it looked cool and existed. This was criticized, and now it's a piece of gaming history, but Oblivion would feature a lot more DLC. Most of it was better than horse armor, including some small quests with rewards and different houses for the player. It'd be followed up with Knights of the Nine, a more involved side quest, and finally the expansion, The Shivering Isles, which also released to major acclaim. Now, while horse armor was a miss, and it is now viewed as an omen of things to come, in all fairness, Bethesda would course correct their DLC model into what I personally think was pretty damn good for a minute. But we'll get there in a bit. For now, remember that contrary to the meaningless and expensive horse armor, hitting the like button is meaningful and completely free. We now move on to Fallout 3, which has a complicated history. First, the license was acquired after Interplay closed down, which held the IP at the time, and it was purchased by Bethesda. And Bethesda did announce that they were going to work on Fallout 3 all the way back in 2004, which shows us a habit that they have of announcing the existence of games very early on, not that that has any relevance today or anything. Principal work on the game wouldn't start until after Oblivion had shipped and updated, since it's the same team that's responsible for Fallout 3. After that announcement, Todd would say in February 2007 that the game was still a ways away, but hey, it was teased in July of 07 and released in November of 08. Fallout 3 and its sister game New Vegas, which I won't really cover here since that isn't a Bethesda game, are some of my personal favorite games of all time, and it's surprising how quickly they made these. Emil Pagliarulo, who also wrote on Oblivion, would helm the main quest writing in Fallout 3, and he will pop up in a bit, and the internet has plenty words to say about him. Once again, Bethesda's new game would release to universal acclaim, despite controversy surrounding the continuation of the Fallout franchise, by people who were not involved in its creation. Those people who created Fallout, by the way, did say that they were interested in continuing the series, but unfortunately for them, Bethesda was the highest bidder. Other people also criticized some of the changes in tone that it had done from the previous entries in the series, and many people claimed that they were changing too much of something so beloved. Other criticisms included its shooting mechanics, since they weren't really like an FPS, it was more of real-time dice rolling, meaning that you could put your cursor on an enemy and you could still miss, but 
Overall, most of the things in the game were highly praised and well-loved, including the world, atmosphere, the VAT system, and many other things. What wasn't loved, though, were the now almost hilarious level of bugs and glitches. Certainly heightened by the growing presence and willingness to share online, the perception seems to be that Fallout 3 contains many more bugs and glitches than the previous games by the studio. Many of them very funny heads spinning or ragdolls glitching or items disappearing, but also many game-breaking and scripting bugs, leading quests unsolvable or leading to soft logs, as well as major stability issues on PS3, leading many people to warn against that version entirely, and all of its frequent, constant crashes, with some unexpected additional consequences sometimes. This is really where the legacy and fame of Bethesda for bugs started, and many a video essay over time would cover it, leading to Joseph Anderson's now iconic Bethesda's bug. I do want to mention, because this is my video, that I don't think the DLC structure for Fallout 3 and New Vegas was bad. Sure, not every expansion, which is how they called them, was great, and they would vary in length and content as well, but as a model to follow where you periodically add larger parts to a game, including expanding on its ending, or things like the excellent point lookout, to me that was all pretty cool. So hey, while there's plenty of controversies, I think it's a nice course correction from Horse Armor. Although it's worth mentioning that all of those expansions came with their own hosts of bugs and glitches, with a common sentiment of the day being that having all of the expansions installed heavily affected the stability of the game as well as overall loading times. And I want to touch on some stuff regarding New Vegas, even though we're not going to cover it in depth. I've seen a lot around the net, but I'm going to be quoting this interview with Josh Sawyer, who was the project lead and designer on New Vegas. Josh was working on the original Fallout 3 at Interplay before everything went down, and he worked on New Vegas along with another Fallout veteran and the writer of Planescape Torment, Chris Avalone. So in the end, a lot of the old guard of Fallout worked on New Vegas, so good for them and good for us. In this interview, Sawyer mentions that they had 18 months to make New Vegas, and that it was only possible thanks to the fantastic tools provided by Bethesda. But as expected, with the time and no prior experience, bugs were just bound to happen. If Bethesda makes buggy games, we can't expect better from a team that doesn't even know the tools. He also mentions how all the DLC in New Vegas was designed to be DLC from the start and planned as standalone adventures, which is just a nice little thing to know. Also, Fallout New Vegas is not overrated. It's still great, at least to me. By the way, since it's worth remembering from time to time, Obsidian, the studio behind New Vegas and many other great games, is now owned by Microsoft, just like Bethesda. So please, please give them the Fallout franchise. It doesn't matter if you love Fallout 4 or 76 or whatever. At the very least, these guys deserve another shot at the franchise just to see what they do. So please, internet, rally behind this. Give Fallout to Obsidian, please. So yes, I want to stop a second because, like I said before, I'm kind of breezing over how terrible the bugs and glitches were in Fallout 3 and New Vegas and the games before it, but they were very serious. As I said, some of them are smaller things, ranging from funny to annoying, with things like items phasing through the map, but there really were a large number of serious bugs, and I remember so many forums I used to frequent having post after post of people confused, wondering if they did something wrong, if it was all working as intended, or if the game had glitched. And that state of confusion speaks to just how janky and common these things were, and they wouldn't get much better once we reach Dovahkiin. Sorry, I mean Skyrim. Now look, it's really clear at this point what the pattern with Bethesda is. And while we all know it, we don't talk about it enough. And I think it's reached the boiling point with Starfield. But here we go again. As always, Skyrim was praised by the masses in critics. It was another big jump. It debuted the Creation Engine, tools developed in-house by Bethesda, but based on the Gamebryo engine. It was the biggest success in terms of sales and cultural exposure that Bethesda had ever had. People praised losing classes and adding dual wielding, the new streamlined user interface which was noticeably better for consoles compared to Oblivion, the perk system, the world design, the general production of it, 
the improvement in writing, which I am legally obligated by the community to add the word debatable improvement in writing, and things like the voice acting. I used to be an adventurer like you, and I took an arrow in the knee. There were criticisms, of course, things like how straightforward the main story was, with the story being kind of told at you instead of you really doing much in it, or the AI or combat. But the biggest criticism, once again, was the technical mess that the game was. And just like every other time, and I'm not acting high and mighty here, I'm sure that at the time my opinion was the same, we forgave all of those technical problems for all of the good in the game, for the unique brand of RPG that Bethesda made, which kept evolving in different ways. But these bugs would not only continue, but become worse. There were frequent crashes, slowdown, scripting breaking, physics breaking, just anything you can imagine, and even corrupted saves. Skyrim would get a ton of patches over time, but I think the unofficial patch list speaks for itself, addressing the issues that remain after the official patches and not all of them. It was expected at this point, it was the norm. And by now, The Elder Scrolls was a console game through and through, which I guess helps with optimizing and bugs, but also not really, because despite being the primary platforms considered in design and also in sales, the console still had a ton of problems, and as usual, there were more on PS3. Skyrim didn't just sell like hotcakes, 3.4 million in two days, which is crazy to think about today, not to mention in 2011, and it would also be followed by DLC and that DLC would also receive some criticism, mainly Hearthfire, which added more in-depth player housing, something that people thought should have been included from the start or at least be free. And I personally didn't like the DLC for Skyrim all that much compared to the Fallout ones, but I might be biased or insane. In April 2013, Bethesda announced that they were moving on from Skyrim, which allow me to laugh because now we know how that goes. <laughs> So we're going to leapfrog a bit here, because Skyrim actually keeps going and overlaps everything except Starfield, so we'll come back to it in a bit, but for now, we move on to Fallout 4. And Fallout 4 was a shit show on a lot of levels. It really symbolizes for a lot of people the start of the decline for Bethesda, even though the clues were there all along. Fallout 4 would release on November 10th, 2015, and listen, it was a massive commercial success. It was bigger on launch than Skyrim, as Pete Hines would say. But get this, the reviews went down, and so did the responses from the community, and for a lot of reasons. Fallout 4 changed a lot of stuff for the better, sure, for one it actually plays like a shooter, which was welcome, but it was also criticized for being less original, less unique, worse written, and containing a lot of changes people didn't like. And listen, I love playing Fallout 4, especially in theory, and very rarely in practice. It's a fun game, especially after a ton of mods, but there's a lot of problems to quote here. The voiced protagonists. This had a couple of problems. For one, the amount of dialogue options were now limited to a very Mass Effect style wheel, commonly attributed to the need of voicing everything and budgets, but it could also just have been streamlining to appeal to a different demographic. Additionally, the options with the wheel were truncated, so you would read the concept of the response, but what your character would say was often different, with some of the first mods available substituting the wheel for traditional text saying exactly what you would say. Then there was a new emphasis on building and outposts, and that's a big topic on its own. It's kind of a take it or leave it thing, but it definitely didn't make everybody happy. Overall, there was and still is a big divide in the community with many claiming that the gameplay and exploration is the best it's been, but the story and RPG elements are the worst they've been. Also, people really didn't like the bugs this time, and it had a lot of bugs, the same as always. But none of this is the biggest blunder, no. So welcome to the Creation Club. Oh yeah, mods would be coming, but for money. In 2017, alongside the release of Skyrim's Special Edition, and I mean look at it, it's so special, Creation Club was implemented in both Fallout 4 and Skyrim Special Edition, and it's an in-game store that sold what many considered mods. I quickly got a hold of my new clothes after loading up a save, and suspiciously put them on. The textures were high quality, the stealth suit kept that cool feature that lets you turn invisible upon crouching, and altogether, they were pretty cool outfits. Then I remembered I just paid 8 bucks for them. 
Sure, these add-ons were nice, but not $8 nice, unless they come with money. A couple of modders on the Nexus could have easily made this content without Bethesda's funding or assistance that the company claims to be lending to Creation Club creators. As a matter of fact, the gameplay you're looking at right now of the Chinese stealth suit isn't actually the Chinese stealth suit that's being offered on the Creation Club. No, it's one I got for free on the Nexus. This is the one that's being offered on the Creation Club. Do you see a difference here? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I fail to see one that constitutes Bethesda's ridiculous price tag. In an attempt to remain somewhat objective, I will say that Bethesda says that the content here was made by independent creators, but using funds from Bethesda. However, the content on the store was not very different from those you could find in mods. So yeah, paid for, curated mods. And to be fair, some modders supported this because it allowed them to make money and improve the quality control. But also, paid mods. They did bring the system to consoles, but it's important to mention that by doing this, they introduced paid mods. And on top of this, it implemented horrible tactics like having to purchase a digital currency to buy the paid mods. I mean, creations, whatever, who cares? This idea of separate currencies ever since Microsoft points has always been a tactic to make you forget how much something really costs and force you into odd amounts of money to get you re-upping your in-game wallet and has been criticized forever. And there's something about putting this into a system that you can use to buy paid mods in a single player game that just makes it that little bit extra horrible. But hey, they reworked the system in December of 2023 into just Creations, which features free mods and paid mods, with the option for paid mods only available to those verified creators by Bethesda. So we'll see how this new version works out. I also want to credit Fallout 4 for butchering the term expansion, which was already hurt with things like Hearthfire and Skyrim, not to mention how different it is from what we used to get many, many years before that. But here, we got things like Automatron, which is just a side quest revolving around the Mechanist, and it was meh and disappointing. But then we got Wasteland Workshop, and this expansion is just building pieces for outposts. It allows you to have cages so you can make creatures fight. And it's like, really? I mean, if you put this as a bonus on top of some other story stuff, that would be cool, but come on, calling this an expansion? And this was followed by Far Harbor, which was actually pretty good. There were two more workshops, and one did include quests around it, so hey, they responded, I guess. The final pack was Nuka World, which again, pretty good, but not amazing. It's also worth mentioning that this was the first year Bethesda went into the mobile game market with the free-to-play Fallout Shelter, which would prove very successful, racking up $5.3 million in sales in its first two weeks, and even receiving some Mobile Game of the Year awards. It was heavily criticized for its use of unnecessary microtransactions, as well as lacking depth, so I don't know how it won awards. I'm not a mobile game expert, but I'm sure there were better games back then. And so we start to reach modern Bethesda, that we know, love, and love to hate. So in 2018, we got Fallout 76, and I want to say something here, not in defense of Bethesda, but in seeking the truth. I have searched all over and found conflicting reports on this. Fallout 76 is quote-unquote co-developed by Bethesda Austin, which used to be Battlecry Studios. I've seen them credited as the ones making multiplayer possible, but also as the main devs due to some quotes from Bethesda saying that Fallout 76 was fully supported by the main studio, so it's not clear how much the main Bethesda team was involved in this. And one day, I'd like to know, just to know. And they're still technically Bethesda Game Studios, this isn't like the Obsidian thing. So this is still a game with their name and should be judged as such. But I want to know, damn it. Anywho's Fallout 76 was the evolution of Fallout into a live service game, and I don't know where to start honestly. Probably at the live service game part. Look, there are redeemable aspects to 76, and I do think that when viewed through a particular lens, some of the criticism towards the game doesn't matter. The fact that there were no human NPCs, and the questing was weird, and all of the robots, a lot of stuff like that I think can even make sense in the story if you look back on it, even if the story is bad, but for me it's more that the design of this game seems to cater to the people that just wanted the core exploration and combat loop of Fallout 4 and didn't care about the classic RPG roots, 
story and character aspects of it. It's just a shame that they didn't do that very well either. Somewhere between pretty bad to it can be fun sometimes if you don't think about it. A lot of the hate this game gets is that it's resources that didn't go into a better idea or a better game or just something that people wanted more. But I've seen people who love this side of the franchise and they really enjoy Fallout 76. So that's a thing. And the discussion can exist for another day by people way more invested in this than I am and more knowledgeable about every detail of this game's existence. For the topic at hand, the launch of Fallout 76 and its business practices were probably the biggest disaster in Bethesda history. As a funny note, it has the shortest time frame from announcement to release of any Bethesda Game Studios game, from 2002 onwards at least, with it announced on May 30th and releasing on November 14th of 2018. And I'm sure that's knowledge that will impress someone at Trivia Night. Fallout 76 launched a flawed, confused game, not catering to many fans and not really catering to the audience it was looking for within the fans. Its systems were messy, its objectives confusing when they weren't outright missing, and its bugs. Oh, its bugs. I'm just going to leave Joseph Anderson's glorious review of the game at launch and his compilation of bugs, which are two of my favorite YouTube videos possibly ever, and they will be linked in the description along with all of the sources that I used for the things in this video. So have fun with that. 76 was so bad. Really, imagine mixing the creation engine's track record with online servers, and that's just the worst. But it didn't end there, oh no, because Bethesda sold in-game cosmetics in this full-price game. Amazing cosmetics where you could spend $20 on some garbage costume or $15 on some stuff for your house. People quickly pointed out how these prices, which also used a separate in-game currency by the way, were enough to buy a whole ass other Bethesda game. Now, it is true that in 76, the in-game currency known as Atoms could be gained from playing, but let's be honest, not really to the extent necessary. And the in-game shop quickly turned into offering quality of life improvements as well as just Improvement improvements, like for your weapons and armor. The game also had a ton of hackers and modders, which was to be expected, and sometimes these two were mixed up. Bethesda famously banned a ton of modders, some of which I'm sure deserved to be banned since they were doing things to duplicate items and affecting servers and the economies, but Bethesda banned a lot of the accounts of modders as well and they sent all of them emails asking them to write an essay on why cheating and using mods was damaging to online video games. Despite the fact that some of these people were innocent, so, hey, Bethesda talking down to their customers? Never, that would never happen. Foreshadowing is a literary device where- So yes, there was also rampant cheating and a big scandal with hackers stealing items from player inventories at a huge scale. In the midst of all of their controversies and terrible decision making, the best way they found to combat the comments around the in-game store, and all of it being too expensive, was of course to reduce the prices on the items. I'm kidding, they released a subscription service, Fallout First. For just $12.99 American a month, you could host private servers, which yes, are paywalled, have unlimited crafting storage, fast travel, extra supplies, and 1,650 atoms every month. What a bargain! Normally, 1,650 atoms would cost you $16.50. So if you think about it, it's a bargain. It pays for itself just in the atoms, plus all the other conveniences. I can't wait to be the first to fall out. Speaking of falling out, the canvas bag. Yeah, they advertised that the special edition of the game would have a canvas duffel bag. And instead, people received a shitty piece of nylon. And after complaints, what did Bethesda do? Well, they gave 500 atoms, or the equivalent to $5, of in-game currency to those affected by this. Great job, Bethesda. There are reports from many different sources, including Kotaku, about excessive crunch during the development, senior staff leaving, and staff being brought on from other studios to just help support the game. And when Wastelanders, the big expansion that brought human NPCs into the game came out, everybody was happy because it fixed everything, except it didn't, because a couple of strokes of paint and some boring humans 
couldn't fix all the problems the game had in so many different areas. There is a full video worth of content just summarizing the stories around Fallout 76 and its community. The game has since then continued to receive support, and you can find all sorts of opinions on how successful that was and how good it is today, which is a little over five years later. From what I played in 2020 when the game released on Steam with the Wastelanders update, it wasn't good. It also wasn't the worst, because the environments were cool and pretty and the combat was decent when the server didn't choke, but it was not at all what I wanted from a game with Fallout in the title. But again, I can understand that for some people, it is. And we can argue up and down on the design, the marketing, if it was or wasn't targeted at the right fans, and the communication around it for days. But at the end of it all, I'm just going to stick the entirety of Fallout 76 on the mistakes list. But hey, if there's people who love this thing, more power to you, genuinely. In 2020, Bethesda would strike at the mobile market once again with the Elder Scrolls Blades, a linear dungeon-crawling roguelite hybrid with PvP and a town hub with quests and NPCs. Everyone disliked it, featuring terrible reviews, especially when it launched on Switch, where it was panned for being boring, aimless, and a terrible representation of the Elder Scrolls. And so we reach the saga that is Starfield. I have individually covered a lot of this stuff, but it's nice to view it from this perspective all the way after looking at all the previous years of Bethesda. And oh boy, Starfield itself is not nearly the disaster that Fallout 76 was, but a lot of what Bethesda has done during this really makes it almost as bad if not worse. And before you ask, Redfall is not a Bethesda Game Studios game, it is an Arcane Austin game. Not by Bethesda, and also not by the main Arcane team behind Dishonored. And there's a lot of stuff there, but it's not within the scope of this video. All of that is outside the house that Todd built, and the house that he seems to try and destroy, so... Starfield is Bethesda's first new IP since 2008 with Fallout 3, which was not a new IP, but it was an IP they took over at that time, so depending on how you want to see it, it's their first new IP since Elder Scrolls, also known as Ever. It was billed as Skyrim in space, and it was not. There was plenty of controversy and online fighting around it, especially after Microsoft bought out ZeniMax, making Bethesda Game Studios an Xbox Game Studio. And after the disappointments with Fallout 4, the enormous levels of hype were contrasted by careful analysis of every word that Todd Howard said, which were a lot, there were a lot of words. Ultimately, the game that released, according to many people, including, um, me, is a game that marks a step down in many aspects from previous games by the studio, with worse design, systems, and even losing some of the most important and immersive ones like exploration. It's been criticized by many people for many different reasons. You might have already seen some videos, and if you haven't seen mine, which I still think is a pretty fair critique, it's in the description below. At the end of the day, there was a perfect storm of hype, disappointment, lies, and more. From how traveling seamlessly isn't possible, to fake planet continuity, to claims from modders saying that it's just too boring to mod. There was plenty of discussion and hate for the game before release, like the infamous tweet saying that the game was bad because we had seen the start screen, and you can know everything about a game from the start screen if you're a developer, I think uh, that, was, that was a weird time. When it did release, review scores were all over the place, with people arguing over them, and Bethesda spinning positive press while responding to some of the stronger criticisms on things like optimization or the lack of DLSS support, because, and you will never guess what I'm about to say, Starfield launched with a lot of bugs and a technical resource hog. Oh man. Bethesda. Bethesda never changes. Many people and outlets, as well as Bethesda themselves, claimed that this was the least buggy Bethesda release ever. Which might even be true. But also, with how much attention and meme status this issue has obtained, it's really like saying that this time your shit pie contains 20% free-range mud. But in the middle of insults and warring back and forth, and SEO chasing from major outlets, there were some real important nuggets. Firstly, the user reviews. After a while, many players that felt disappointed by Starfield began to leave negative reviews on Steam. Many of these, and more importantly, the ones that we care about for this video, are from players with many hours in the game, ranging from 30 hours on the low end to several hundreds on the high end. 
So it's safe to say they're real fans of Bethesda that just don't recommend the game, and they often leave long, detailed reviews explaining why. And Bethesda thought the best thing to do was to publicly answer these negative reviews with some of the absolute stupidest replies imaginable, claiming, essentially, that users didn't like the game because they were playing it wrong, including quotes as memorable and hopefully meme-worthy as, when the astronauts got to the moon and saw it was empty, they weren't bored. This spun into a ton of backlash from users and outlets as investigations into the curious wording of these replies led people to reverse engineering AI like ChatGPT to discover that there was a very high likelihood the replies were AI generated, or at the least, AI assisted. So not only was Bethesda talking down to loyal fans leaving genuine criticism, but they couldn't even be bothered to talk down to them themselves and used AI for it instead. <laughs> you can't make this up. It got even worse when Emil Paglierulo, mentioned earlier as a writer on Oblivion, story writer on Fallout 3, and design lead on Fallout 4 and Starfield, took to Twitter, sometimes known as X, to cry. Emil would call into question the legitimacy of critics that were criticizing the game in a long 15-tweet rant, saying that people shouldn't speak as they do about why the game is bad because they don't know how games are made. He tried some other manipulative tactics to basically discredit and disregard a lot of the criticism that was being thrown at the game, leading to very angry critics and a lot of criticism of him, which, don't worry, he's had as a writer over the years as well. This narrative was then taken to extremes as different modders claimed different things about the game, which are precisely the people outside of the studio which would know the most about the inner workings of the game, so at least Emil got exactly what he asked for. There you go, the very people that you're accused of relying on to fix your games are now criticizing it. So congratulations Emil, your call was answered. Speaking of which, if you would like to support something that unlike Bethesda is constantly improving and executing on creative ambitions, consider subscribing to the channel. Unlike Bethesda games, it's completely free and features no additional microtransactions. And of course, it supports the creation of independent criticism, opinion pieces, and long essays and retrospectives, just like this one, directly counteracting the attempts of Bethesda. Also, unlike Bethesda, I actually give a shit. If you're not convinced, there's still some video, so don't worry about it. Continuing with the wars between those defending the game, including its developers, and those baffled at the reaction, a narrative was spun surrounding content creators spearheading a movement to review bomb and badmouth Bethesda, just as Bethesda released player numbers and Steam crowned Starfield as one of the top sellers, leading to even more debate to keep Starfield on the front page. And if there's one thing we can say about Starfield, is that it's good at dominating the news headlines. Starfield has shown something much deeper than what we see at the surface. It's beyond a controversial game on a studio's now long continued descent from the throne and beyond the disappointment. It's a show of how times have changed and how at least some people have decided to stop putting up with Bethesda's pattern, made easier by their aging technology and lack of innovation, and even their ability to fail at executing on the design decisions that many have come to expect from them. And while studios change, and so do leaders, decision makers, and the majority of the staff, it's poetic to take this trip down memory lane and see how many mistakes are repeated and how many trends have formed over time. What was once a studio focused on being at the forefront of technology is now one hampered by it. Its repeating pattern of excessive ambition that it struggled to rein in overtook it conceptually while settling for what they could deliver. One of the first studios to ever enter the arena of further monetization would course correct, only to then be one of the worst perpetrators of the worst practices possible within it. And when their fans called them out on these things and critics started to shy away, they were so accustomed to the easy treatment and constant forgiveness of their failings, where people told them that the issues weren't that important. They were all overlooked for all of the good that people saw in their games until there was not enough good in them for people to look the other way when faced with those shortcomings. And what did they do when those people spoke up? Well, 
condescend their customers, and attempt to discredit their critics. The Starfield saga to me shows a sin beyond releasing broken games. It shows a studio too proud, too big to fail in their own minds and in their marketing budgets, that their philosophy is not one of recognizing mistakes and showing improvement like they did all the way back when Morrowind. When they decided to reduce the scope of that game and push for better technology, and now, instead, it's a studio that reacts to their failures not with searching for a way to rebuild trust with their customers, but one that blames those customers for not trusting that the game gets better after 60 hours. And this is a sad story. It doesn't make me happy to take a trip down a memory lane that is covered in mistakes. Making this video was entertaining. Fun even. But faced with writing a satisfying conclusion to this video, tasked with leaving a bookmark on this ongoing story, I find myself looking down at the keyboard with sadness. Falls from grace are never truly satisfying, no matter how deserved they are. We love redemption stories, we love to root for the underdog, deep rivalries, or complex villains to topple. But Bethesda Game Studios is none of these things. The relationship between us and them is simple. They're supposed to make great games, and we're supposed to play them. When all of that is muddled and tainted with the stains of conflict, greed, and conformity, we end up with stories like these. Not a villain, but a former ally, one many of us had come to love, falling in agonizing slow motion off a building that they decided to jump off of. We never wanted them to do it. We don't enjoy the fall, not really. And like all the worst or best arguments, depending on how you view it, you end up asking yourself, how did we even end up here? And while I hope this video serves both to answer that question and to mark a point in time moving forward, all I ever really wanted was for them to get off their high horse by walking down the goddamn stairs. And hopefully one day, Bethesda will make great games again, but until then, there's a lot of trust that needs to be repaired, and if you make me choose between watching them continue to fall, or see them get back up, shake the dust off, and make something great, I'm always going to choose the latter. And just as hopefully, I intend to be there and tell you what they did or didn't do, as always. It's easy to see this track record and be skeptical of The Elder Scrolls 6, and I for sure am, and you for sure should be. But I'm hoping that they can turn it around like they've done before, instead of sinking deeper like they've also done before, and make something great in the end. Because as much as failures can be entertaining, I'd rather play a great game and tell you a story of redemption than one of ruin. So hey, I've been Mug Thief, and if you enjoyed this video, I ask that you consider supporting my YouTube channel in all the usual ways. Leave a like, because it truly does help. Subscribe for more. Share this video with a friend or post it somewhere. And as my regular viewers have come to expect, if you made it all the way here, sneak in I used to be an adventurer into your comment, for old times sakes, and I will heart every single one that does so. I read all of them, so have some fun with it, but maybe don't torture me too much. Some of you have been slipping these little sentences I leave at the end into some really long and weird comments. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you again very soon.